Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today we're back speaking remotely with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is an orthopedic surgeon who practices in Northern Ohio. Uh, Dr. Seeds uh, practices in Ashtabula, Ohio, and sees patients from all over uh, uh, Northern Ohio. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Seeds. Good afternoon, Randy. Thanks for having me back. Well, thanks for joining us, and today what I would like to cover is a, a really common injury in the uh, uh, ankle uh, that I think everybody is probably uh, familiar with, and that's the common ankle sprain. And I think for you and I as orthopedic surgeons, the common ankle sprain is probably nothing common at all. And I think there's plenty of, of things that can occur when we twist our ankle or invert the ankle or sometimes referred to as roll the ankle. but that injury can be a simple injury that gets better on its own, or it can be a, a fairly serious injury that requires some type of surgical intervention. So today I thought what we would do is go through your surgical decision making, your evaluation of patients who may have had an ankle sprain, both when the ankle sprain occurs and then down the road when patients are, are continuing to have problems with uh, an ankle that is giving them trouble after maybe one, two, or multiple sprains. So let's define some, in some ways the, the terrain we're going to cover and can you describe for the audience uh, what we refer to when we talk about an ankle sprain or an inversion injury of the ankle? Sure, Randy. Uh, ankle injuries are probably one of the most common injuries that we'll see in the office in our young athletes and they, they certainly are sports specific, but I'd say across the board, we, we see ankle injuries in, in all sports. And in particular, in describing these injuries, we see these injuries that commonly occur more with inversion injuries where they roll the ankle, so to speak, on the outside of the ankle, it rolls in, and they have instantaneous pain and swelling on the outside of their ankle and occasionally there may be some pain that's associated on the inside of the ankle. Uh, that may be some other ligamentous injury associated, but we're just kind of concentrating, I think, right now on the outside of the ankle with a common, what we call, inversion injury. And we'll look and try to classify those injuries based on how severely we feel that they have injured those lateral ankle structures, which are the what we call the anterior talofibular and the calcaneofibular ligaments, and also the posterior uh, talofibular. But most, most importantly are those two front ligaments that really give the stability with, with also the capsule of the ankle. And we'll try to assess that initially as to the degree of injury. And um, as far as the soft tissue, and we also have to pay attention to the bone and make sure that there's no associated fracture with it. Now, when you see one of these injuries uh, acutely, when you've, you see it a day or two days after uh, it's occurred, what are you worried about at that point? What are you trying to determine uh, when you see a patient and, and do that evaluation? Well, initially, we, we want to be able to, to appreciate the, the fact that it is just purely a soft tissue injury. Uh, where it may just involve the, the ligamentous structures and we want to look and address how significant the swelling and how significant the pain is for this patient. Um, do they have pain with weight bearing? Is their pain just associated with motion? You know, can they walk but there's pain with the walking? So you kind of use all of these to grade the severity of that injury. And also in looking at the skin and soft tissue, is it just swollen? Do we see uh, areas of where it looks like there's uh, like it's actually bled into the, the skin and soft tissue, which we call ecchymosis, um, that those are more indicators of a more severe injury of the ankle and, and also possible fracture. So we're trying to assess all those things acutely. And, you know, initially our treatment plan is, is compression and elevation and ice um, and trying to get an evaluation early as to is there a true grossly unstable injury here or is it is it something where we can quickly mobilize this patient and uh, and get them get them back moving with this as we try to treat the injury you know I think these injuries are so common that a lot of people just assume that one, that when you twist your ankle or if you sprain your ankle really know how no matter how bad it is this is an injury that they're going to probably proceed to treat on their own and, and not necessarily 
uh, go in to see a health care provider, whether it's an emergency room, an urgent care, or, or maybe a trainer or a physical therapist or even an orthopedic surgeon. Can, can you give people some idea about what sorts of things should should drive them to actually seek some type of medical care. You know, maybe go and have that ankle examined, maybe go and have some x-rays or something done, uh, rather than just sort of, of adopt the, the, the age-old strategy of elevation, ice, compression, and then sort of see how it goes. Um, give us some guidelines that you would want patients to use when to say this is not the typical ankle sprain that's simply gonna get better on its own necessarily, and I need to go see a healthcare provider. Sure, Randy. Well, I, I think this is a, th th what you've brought up is very important. You know, all ankle injuries, I, anybody listening to this right now could tell you, you know, once they've rolled their ankle, they know that that injury is a, has been a lingering injury for them. It hasn't been something they just got by in a week or two weeks. It w it's always, everybody can relate to that fact that, boy, they remember back five years ago, four years ago, or when they were younger, boy, when I rolled that ankle, it was problematic from that point on, from, from some point to another where it just didn't get better like they expected it to. And I believe ankle injuries are very important in getting to the, uh, the appropriate care physician, such as an orthopedic surgeon, who can, can evaluate that initially with x-ray, exam, and treatment plan, all in that same visit where you know what you're dealing with, you know what to expect in the future, and you know what, every, what the plan is. Because the sooner you get on these injuries, the less likely this is to be a problematic uh, area for that athlete in the future. And uh, you know as well as I do, in dealing with these ankle injuries, they're very difficult to deal with when they become chronic problems. And the, I couldn't express more the importance of getting to the trainer or that orthopedic surgeon specifically to start some treatment plan and follow up. And, and we're very aggressive with this with our trainer. Our trainer sees these ankle injuries specifically at the Great Center, sees these injuries all the time. They, they act with ice, they act with the exam, they give the treatment mode and the plan, and we follow up with these patients because it's very important very important if they're not seeing a, an orthopedic surgeon that you stay on top of these because people will let these go and assume they're going to get better but not in in most of these ankle injuries with these inversion injuries there is there needs to be a plan to rehab that ankle and get to the next step or else it does turn into a chronic injury well, we've mentioned a couple of things in terms of uh, other injuries that could occur, such as a fracture, but I think there are far more types of injuries that can occur in, in, a, in an ankle that's been rolled or inverted than simply a fracture or an ankle sprain. Can you sort of give patients a, an idea of some of the different type of injuries that occur when we when we suffer one of these injuries. Uh, you know, you mentioned fractures, but there's also fractures within the joint itself, small little chip fractures where we may damage the articular surface on the inside of the joint. There's also tendon injuries, and, and obviously we've talked about chronic injuries, but the most common problem after an ankle sprain is, is what you and I would probably term chronic instability, where that ankle is no longer as tight as it once was. And, and that causes problems. Not only does it cause uh, perhaps ongoing pain, but it causes uh, a weak ankle that uh, is more likely uh, to be injured again and, and continue to injure those ligaments to the point to where the ankle, the ankle is very unstable. So give us an idea uh, about the different range of uh, problems that you're trying to assess when you see that patient and, and will become part of the decision-making process as you uh, get that patient uh, working again, walking again, playing sports again, and monitor their progress. Sure, Randy. The, the, the aspects of, of, of looking at this is definitely a comprehensive review of, of what to expect and what you're thinking that possibly that patient could have involved in this injury. One has to do with the way it happened. The second is to, to evaluate and inspect the ankle in looking at the possibilities of ruling out the fracture, 
ruling out the injury that we'd call intraarticular? Is there the possibility of, like you said, an avulsion fracture of the bone inside the joint, or is there truly is there a cartilage injury? Is there a cartil is there cartilage displacement? Is there bone bruising inside the ankle joint or uh, the uh, joint subsequently below the ankle? Are those bone bruising is bone bruising a, a problem? And and it is. It's you know are these things important in evaluation? Absolutely. The perineal tendons that travel right under the fibula, the bone that's real important in that ankle stability. Sometimes those those tendons are injured in in a in a severe ankle roll or in sometimes not a modern ankle roll you can get tendon injuries you can get the tendons can move out of the out of their groove which we call subluxating or dislocating or snapping tendons um, these are all of these aspects are very important in trying to put the picture together when you're trying to make a treatment plan for that patient and and where to go with that these these injuries can happen individually, they can happen together, and it's very important, as I said, right off the bat, the x-ray and the exam, and I have found for, for a lot of ankle injuries that MRI is invaluable in, uh, in helping you assess the joint as we talked about the cartilage and the, uh, the bone bruising, uh, the tendons, uh, things that we can't see, we can appreciate on exam, but again, you know, you're looking at a swollen joint uh, you're looking at a painful joint, what else can you use to help you zone in on that diagnosis and what will help you early on in that treatment? And I have found that not only with x-ray, MRI is invaluable in giving uh, you a complete assessment of, of that extremity. Um, I, I think a lot of us have gotten away from you know rest and elevation and let things go for four to six weeks and let that swelling go down before you get before you start setting up that plan. And I, I think we've all gotten very, very much acute to the fact that these injuries are significant early on. And the early on, the sooner we get to them and start treating them, the better off that patient's gonna be down the road. Now you mentioned that, that you, you obviously wanna see these patients early. And you mentioned that you're pretty quick to go ahead and get an x-ray if there's any question that there could be something going on with the, with the skeletal system, whether it's a, a small chip fracture or a, or a bona fide fracture in one of the, the bigger bones. You also mentioned that after you evaluate the ankle that you're pretty quick to do an MRI scan. I'm curious uh, as to when and, and how many ankle sprains you would, you would uh, presume that you do an MRI scan right off the bat. Is this something you do on every ankle sprain or every severe ankle sprain or are there specific indicators that that would tend to push you into ordering uh, an MRI scan as soon as you see the patient? Well, I, I think that's multifactorial. I mean, I think it depends on the severity of that injury. Um, you know, how did it happen? I think it also, if I have a combination of, of what I feel are injuries together, um, where I you know, I, I'm suspecting that there's an intraarticular injury associated with it where I may see something on x-ray, but I can't clearly define it. Um, when I can appreciate on exam that maybe those tendons are subluxating out of place, uh, where grossly I feel an instability of the ankle initially, where maybe those ligaments have completely ruptured and I suspect it initially, so I would say maybe the more moderate and severe ankle injuries, I'm, I'm very quick to, to definitely order the MRI where I feel that I'm going to, I'm going to hurt the patient if I don't, if I don't act appropriately in, in trying to get these studies where, where I'm already suspecting that the injury is there. On the more mild injuries uh, where, where I feel, you know, there's been ligamentous injuries specifically, and maybe it's just been a stretching. You know, you mentioned that that this term instability, I, I think it's important to understand that when when we have these ankle injuries, if you if you can look at a ligament as a structure like this and it stretches, most of these ligaments don't go back to their normal length, so they're they heal in a lengthened state, and then we see that instability because the ligaments aren't as tight as you indicated. Um, with a more of a stretching type of injury, I may not be you know so so early to, to get an MRI initially, but, but I hope that helps you. I, I think it, it really depends on the exam. 
I'd say out of all the ankle injuries we see, you know, the moderate to severe ones, it, it's been changing. Uh, we, we see more of these more severe injuries now with these, uh, again, with, with our younger athletes playing these sports specific programs year round where they're not recovering fast enough, they're playing the sport too much. Uh, uh, it, it's it's definitely changed for me in the last five to eight years I would say where we're seeing I, I would say more than half of our injuries are moderate to severe ankle injuries and that's concerning and and yeah I, we we are we are aggressive with those type of injuries well let's move on a little bit and talk uh, about treatment um, I think that that you, you've defined the, the mild strain, the, the moderate to severe ankle sprain, how do you treat those differently in, in terms of what are you going to recommend at that point uh, for that patient based on your findings from the x-rays, the exam, and the MRI scan? Well, in, initially with all of these injuries, we're, we're trying to set the mode that with the patient that we do believe it's important to mobilize these ankle injuries as, as acutely as we can. And if, if the injury, say, is a mild injury with maybe some ligamentous strain or stretching with swelling and pain, we will assist that patient with some type of mo bracing modality where, it, let's say, it's a, an articulating brace that they can wear in a shoe or tennis shoe, and we'll let, them, we'll let them walk with it, but we'll get them into a therapy program immediately or, or teach them uh, the, the uh, program that we'd like them to follow of where we're trying to mobilize that joint initially. We, we want mobility with it. We want to start strengthening the, the tendons around that ankle and work on, on building back uh, some, of the, some, some of the strength around that ankle and, and get that mobility to, to assist with the swelling because that's, that's always an issue with these ankle injuries is swelling that, that will continue. Uh, even after the injury is healed. So we're very quick to mobilize these joints um, in, in the simple injuries. In the more moderate and severe injuries, um, we're, I, I'm more in a, a, a depending on, on what I feel is happening on the exam and how the MRI may correlate with it, uh, we may be, uh, take the step of immobilizing the joint for a period of time, anywhere from two weeks to four weeks up to six weeks and we'll do that in some type of um, cam walker, a, a cast boot, or some of them I may even cast. It, it really depends on the, the, the patient, the family, and you know, how well they think they can follow the guidelines of maybe of the immobilization and elevation. So it depends on that severity, and then from there, um, then we start the mobilization maybe at two weeks, four weeks, or six weeks, depending on how severe we feel the injury is. And, um, and then we carry it from there. But there, there's always a plan, there's always a process that, that the patient understands and, and that we, we move forward with it. And we, we always, we, we try to make the family and the patients understand that this is something that they're gonna be working with uh, for this next, say, six week period, but it's gonna, there are things that are gonna linger on for up to the next three to four months that they need to keep working with. Uh, and again, depending on the severity, that, that could go up to six months to eight months to a year. So these are all serious injuries, but can be treated appropriately and early enough, you can contain these injuries and, and really make a difference in the future for these patients. Now, you've mentioned the rehab, you've mentioned the, the conservative care or the, uh, the care with bracing and uh, just giving it time to heal. Do you ever operate on these patients acutely? Uh, what what drives you to consider an operation right off the bat? Um, very rarely do we, uh, for instability issues, do we offer any surgical intervention right away. Uh, maybe there may be an indication for that if you see a complete disruption of the ligament from the bone or a little avulsion fracture with that ligament, then um, we'll discuss it with, with the patient and the family. It depends on the age. Uh, but I would tell you that for the most, for most of these injuries acutely, uh, we treat them very conservatively. Uh, we treat them aggressively, but conservatively in, in trying to avoid any interoperative or any type of operative approach 
initially. Well, let's move along a little bit and talk about uh, the cases where the patient continues to have problems. And I think most of us as orthopedic surgeons are always aware that we're constantly thinking about is this more than just a common ankle sprain? Is there something going on inside the joint? Is there something going on that's causing chronic instability that allows that ankle to have a little bit too much play and constantly give the patient pain and problems? Um, and, and at some point, we're going to have to make the decision that conservative care is not working. And we're going to sit down and discuss with that patient options for treatment in terms of surgery to try to control some of their symptoms. At what point do you have that discussion with the patient and what does that discussion look like? Well, usually that's, that discussion is, is something that really begins with a patient that's had multiple episodes of this instability uh, where they've gone through the treatment plan, they've gone through some therapeutic plans, they've, they've tried to do the, continue the therapy on their own and they they continue to demonstrate instability uh, despite all those conservative measures and strengthening programs that you've set up for the, specifically for the perineal tendons around that, outside of that ankle. The, the other issue that, that is important to, uh, to observe with this is if they've had any type of bracing that they've been involved in a specific sport and they're still unstable in the brace is another indicator of where we may be uh, more inclined to have that discussion with the uh, uh, family and patient. And uh, it all is more specific for what we're trying to do is to help them stabilize that ankle to, to keep them from injuring the cartilage, uh, which can lead to, as we know, bigger problems in the future. And sometimes we do find down the road that, you know, they may have initially had a bone bruise that uh, did progress to where it developed into a, a, con, a cartilage injury uh, and they displaced some cartilage later on with a second repeat injury. Um, so, so we do see these things where, where we have continued problems and, uh, and then we address them with uh, a surgical option of trying to stabilize this ankle for them and, uh, and give them some stability with just their daily activities uh, basically and, and hopefully build back uh, the ankle to where some of them can can go back to their sports with with appropriate bracing. Well I think we ought to probably point out for patients that that like a lot of orthopedic injuries we're worried as orthopedic surgeons worried about two time frames. We're worried about the symptoms that the patient is having of instability, for example. So uh, an athlete is going to say, you know, I can't play my sport because my ankle is unstable and I can't trust it. And it hurts when I sprain the ankle. We as orthopedic surgeons are also worried about 20, 30 years from now because, as you mentioned, I think one of the problems with an unstable ankle is not that just you're twisting it constantly, but that instability is damaging the cartilage. And what we're really worried about is, is 20 to 30 years from now when, when you develop end-stage arthritis or wear and tear osteoarthritis of the ankle and then you're looking at a, a painful ankle that's painful all the time. It's no longer unstable but it's worn out. So a lot of our surgical intervention is addressing both of those time frames. One is to try to give the athlete a stable ankle that he can trust in terms of playing his sport and not being laid up on crutches when the ankle goes out but we're also interested in trying to reduce the risk of developing arthritis down the road. And that's where trying to make this decision about surgical uh, options and trying to decide when it's appropriate to do surgery has to take both of those things into consideration. Are you, are you in agreement with that? Yes, Randy, I, I think you summed up that, that point very well. It, it, those are all issues that, that we are, uh, we're addressing initially. Well, let's talk a little bit about different options for surgical reconstruction. I think that there, there have been numerous different uh, ways that patients um, have had their ankles fixed, stabilized surgically over the years. Um, in the old days, this used to be a very big operation with a large incision, and we used the tendons in the area to do a reconstruction where we actually reconstructed those ligaments. 
probably in a lot of cases that, that was way overkill for uh, the, the, the instability that was going on. I think that, that as things have progressed, we have gone to more minimally invasive techniques. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing from you how you address ankle instability, the, the regular, let, let's call it the regular run-of-the-mill ankle instability, the lateral ankle instability. How do you most commonly approach this surgically in terms of trying to stabilize an ankle that is, is what some patients would refer to as weak or unstable? Sure. Well, if, if I'm making a surgical decision and I, we've come to the conclusion that they've failed all of the measures and, and treatment plans that we've tried to follow to, to stabilize and assist them and the bracing hasn't, has not been sufficient and we have that discussion and how are we going to approach this ankle. And, and I'll tell you, through my years of, uh, of progressing with these injuries, just as you discussed, I mean, I've gone through the the tendon replacements of using the tendons to reconstruct the, you know, in open procedures and reconstructing the, the uh, lateral structures of the ankle to where we've, we've gotten to where a more refined mini incision on the outside of the ankle where we did what we would have called the modified brostrum uh, repair of where we did more of a, a repair versus a reconstruction where we could um, stabilize these ankles to where We've had, I would say, probably within the last four or five years, more of a uh, an even less invasive process of arthroscopically going in the ankle, evaluate where we do get to evaluate the articular cartilage uh, better with a better view of of the injury, uh, intraarticular meaning inside the joint, where we address those lateral ligamentous structures and the capsule at the same time and do something to try to reduce that volume by plicating the capsule and the uh, um, the uh, stretched out ligaments in uh, closing down the, the ankle space and I, I've, I've been very fortunate to find that that has been a very uh, very valid and, and successful way in treating my, my more uh, mild to moderate ankle injuries. In terms of, of surgical rehabilitation, do, does the rehab after you perform surgery vary from, from what you've described in terms of uh, uh, the conservative treatment of, of the acute injury? Uh, pretty much the the post-operative treatment is and the therapeutic approach is the same as the uh, as our approach with a close treatment you know depending on the on the procedure um, we still will we may immobilize that ankle if there's an associated cartilage injury for a period of time or we may start doing range of motion exercises um, initially but still lock the patient up in a, a boot or a cast um, or a, a half cast where we can take their ankle out and work with a therapist just on mobilization, not where we're stretching the ligament, but we're keeping the joint mobilized and then progress them along with, uh, with their strengthening program when at that four to six week mark when we feel that capsule and ligament uh, has healed. So we pretty much kind of take the same approach as we would conservatively just, and it's the same, it's the same therapeutic exercises and, and modalities that we would use. Now, how, how long do you keep these uh, athletes out of the sport? Uh, for example, a basketball player or a football player or a soccer player, um, how long are they out of their sport after an ankle reconstruction? Uh, it, I, I tell most of them that, that it's a definite three to four month time frame. Uh, I think it's three months before, you know, they may feel at three months, they may be back um, in the gym shooting a basket, you know, jumping and doing things, but they're still not at that competitive level yet to where they can, they can do those rotational moves and, and things that I believe that you, you need to depend on that stability. That follows that three month time frame for another six to eight weeks where that's where the more intense training will, I think is more viable. Now, I've had people that have returned, that have, you know, returned to their sport within that three month time frame, but it, it, it's kind of gone, it, it hasn't been by on our recommendation. I, I feel that even though you get everything healed, they feel good, um, they're able to do their normal activities, it's a whole different game when they're playing competitively um, versus just you know shooting around a gym or jumping up and hitting that volleyball or um, you know going out and playing or, or demanding that, that speed and, 
tempo and agility that needs to occur in, in playing in that athleticism, you know, that's involved in the sport. So um, I think we try to give them a very realistic, conservative uh, uh, number. And we say, look, at three months, you'll be back participating, but we don't believe you'll be at that competitive level. And that next step will be determined over the next six to eight weeks after that three month time frame. Well, I think to be complete, any discussion of surgical options, and, and for that matter, treatment options need to cover potential complications. And I think we've talked a little bit about some of the potential complications that we as orthopedic surgeons see of an ankle sprain. One is the, the associated injuries. Maybe it's not just a, a common ankle sprain. The other is that, that whole piece about the risk of developing osteoarthritis 30 years from now and then having to have something done with that ankle because it's, it's constantly painful. We probably should talk a little bit about the upfront risk of surgical uh, techniques that, that are used to, to treat the ankle. What do you worry about as an orthopedic surgeon when you've made the decision that the, the risk of surgery are outweighed by the benefits and begin to talk to that patient about having an operation? What do you tell them might go wrong? Well, my biggest worry is you know, obviously it's the standard, we talk about the standard issues of any surgery as far as infection, um, the, the possibility of developing blood clots in that extremity, uh, two, of the, two of the more typical things that are atypical but typical things if you're going to have a complication that you may see in a surgery like this. But I think more, probably more appropriately is the discussion about re-injury. You know, I consider it a complication if it's within a a short period of time of where there's some there's a re-injury that where the patient hasn't been able to stay compliant with the the process or hasn't been able to follow the process or somehow ha, you know had a re-injury or fell using their crutches where they've re-injured that repair and and those can be more difficult to to take care of and to to help progress you know through that surgery um, but I think it's it's probably you know, one other aspect that's, that sometimes you, that I think you always need to indicate to the families if, if you are doing a more of an open procedure is there will be some skin sensation loss that around that incision site and, and families will perceive that absolutely as a, a, a problem from the surgery. So you need to inform them that it, there's a high likelihood that you will lose a little bit of sensation around the lateral aspect of the ankle just because of your incision. Um, other than that, I think those, besides the, uh, the infection and the, uh, the, the vascular problem with the blood clot and the, the uh, nerve, I, I think those are probably the, the most common, uh, uncommon but common things that you'll see. And, and they're all, those risk assessments for that are, are all less than 1% of, of, of the surgeries that, that are undertaken with these type of procedures. But, you know, percentages are, as I tell the families, and, you know, you can, I can, I can give you that statistic, but if you're that 1%, those statistics don't mean much. So they really need to take those things seriously when they're considering this process. Well, I think we probably ought to also point out that even though we hope that we're reducing some of the risk of developing those long-term complications, such as osteoarthritis, we never are able to reduce those down to zero. And once that ankle is injured, we're dealing with an abnormal situation, and surgery is not going to make it a normal situation. It may make it a better situation, but it's not going to make it a normal situation. And I think that it's probably very important that all of us sit down with patients and make sure that their expectations are realistic. And we've, we've conveyed what the real benefits of the procedure are, and, and in some cases, what the real risks are. Right, and, and Randy, I, I'm, I'm more of a proponent of when that initial injury has occurred, I I let the family and patients know that there, you know, that there, we know that there can be problems with that ankle down the road. That that inciting event, that single traumatizing event, may have caused enough damage that that maybe we can't assess at this point, but may cause arthritis later on in life. And if there's any procedure that we do for say stabilizing that that ankle, it may not stop that arthritis from occurring because it started right when that event occurred. But if they have an unstable ankle, which is leading to maybe accelerate that arthritis, 
then maybe that stabilizing procedure, you know, our intent is to is to help with the pain, stabilize that ankle, and maybe slow down that process of that arthritis showing up sooner than it may. Well, I think this has been a very thorough uh, discussion about the, what we would commonly uh, refer to as an ankle sprain. You and I understand that, that there's no such thing as a common ankle sprain, that all of these ankle sprains are different, and each one has the potential to, to be much more complex than simply a, a strain of a ligament. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you think patients should understand before we leave this discussion? Just uh, my, my, only, my only message would be that uh, as much as we think that an ankle sprain is, is something that, that maybe we can get by with, I, I do believe that uh, get by with meaning you treat it yourself and you go back to your sport and you're going to be better. I would tell you that uh, most of the people I see have that that have tried that route end up having more problems down the road with their with these injuries and and I really believe that the sooner you get and seek some advice and treatment with these injuries you're doing yourself a favor of keeping this under control and getting yourself back into that sport or activity a lot sooner because they're the, these ankle injuries, as, as you and I have, have discussed, are, are really significant injuries. And, and there are a multitude of factors that play into the significance and severity of these injuries. Well, thanks for joining us today. Excellent advice. And I hope to uh, discuss other issues uh, in orthopedics with you uh, at a later date. Thank you. Thank you, Randy.